Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this is going to be a two-parter. It's going to be speaking about the CT evaluation of vasculitis, looking at classification, and looking at some of the key findings and things you need to know. Vasculitis is a very complicated problem, and we are seeing more patients these days with vasculitis. Unfortunately, the radiologist really don't know a lot except for sort of some broad strokes about vasculitis. And I'm going to try to really share with you some information that uh, I've put together over the last couple of months in preparing a talk for this meeting. Now, when you look at some of the articles and some of the basic terms, vasculitis is a systemic disease characterized by the non-infectious inflammation of the blood vessels. The cause can be primary or secondary to an underlying disease. The precise pathophysiology of idiopathic vasculitis is unknown. Therefore, classification is based on vessel size, large, medium, and small, and variable. Large vessel vasculitis predominantly involves the large vessels, like the aorta and its main branches, but can also affect medium or small size vessels. In variable vessel vasculitis, any vessel can be affected, and no type of vessel predominates. Now, when you look at where the vasculitis classification comes from, it comes from this Chapel Hill Consensus Conference that was done first time 1994, and many updates have happened. And it's really this um, conference that really has the nomenclature that everybody uses. So if you really want to keep up to date, just make sure you're keeping up to date on this Chapel Hill Consensus. So I'll just take part of what they say. You can read the entire thing on your own time. They break things up into large vessel vasculitis, and there you sit Takayashu and giant cell arteritis. They then sell medium-sized vasculitis, which affects predominantly medium-sized blood vessels, mainly the visceral arteries and their branches. And in that, we think about polyarthritis nodosa and Kawasaki's disease. So again, two big terms in that point. Then we talk about small vessel vasculitis, which affects small vessels, intraparenchymal arteries, arterioles, capillaries, and venules, and there's many things there. There's the ANCA-associated vasculitis, which includes things like granulomatosis with polyangitis, which was with Wegner's, Churg-Strauss syndrome, which is now called eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, and microscopic polyangitis. We also talk about immune complex vasculitis, including IgA-related, so that becomes important. We also talk about this variable vasculitis, which can affect any size vessel. The two things that we see there are Kogan syndrome and Bassett syndrome, two things we rarely see. We also talk about single organ vasculitis, which affects vessels of any size in a specific organ, including isolated aortitis, cutaneous leukocytoclastic angitis. Now, those things are indeed rare, but at least something to think about. So for us, mainly is this large, medium, and small vessels. And that's really what you want to think about. And that's really the things, particularly the large and the medium, are the things we're going to run into in our practice. Now, CT is very good in looking at vasculitis. It's non-invasive, of course. It can define the extent of disease, and it could show you changes following therapy. It looks at the range of vessels. Uh, it can be very helpful in looking at the differential diagnosis, also looking beyond the vessels at the various organs. So that becomes very important, as I'll show you. In terms of CT technique, typically arterial phase alone is all you need, about a 30-second delay. Though sometimes, particularly when we want to look at the other organs, like in polyarthritis nodosa, you want more information about the kidney, then venous or occasionally delayed phase imaging will be necessary. 3D mapping is important because looking at vessel disease only on axial imaging can be very limited, particularly in areas like the arch and in branching off the mesenteric vessels. So 3D mapping, MIP is particularly helpful, but volume rendering and cinematic rendering also very helpful. And again, as I mentioned, multi-phase acquisition can be valuable. And here's just a good example making the point. I'm showing you several MIP images and a cinematic rendering that when you're looking at a case like this, which is polyarthritis nodosa, 
The original interpretation did not suggest these multiple small aneurysms, which are extremely obvious in the kidneys, in the splenic artery, in the SMA and its branches, because they were little dots which no one really understood. It was only when we did the 3D that we could make a very specific diagnosis. So let's look at some things. Giant cell arteritis. It's a form of large vessel vasculitis, so it's GCA. It affects the aorta and its branch vessels. It commonly affects carotid, vertebral, and temporal arteries, leading to the characteristic temporal headaches, which is often the key for the diagnosis. It predominantly affects female patients who are older than age 50 and is more prevalent in Western countries as opposed to Takayasu's aortitis. Giant cell arteritis is the most common form of vasculitis in the elderly. So it's very important to remember it's a disease of older patients, the vessels particularly off the arch. And it's important to diagnose because it can be treated with immunosupportive therapies as well as corticosteroids. And so if you can intervene early, you can change the course of the patient's disease. We used to always say temporal artery biopsy was the gold standard, and it in fact is, but imaging now can give you similar information, and particularly in older patients, you want to do as little as possible, yet get the right diagnosis. The American College of Rheumatology requires at least three of the following to make the diagnosis age over 50, new onset localized headache, temporal artery tenderness or reduced pulsation, elevated... Uh, ESR over 50 mm per hour, and abnormal arterial biopsy. Again, uh, you need three of those, so you don't necessarily need a biopsy. CTA can evaluate the mural thickening, stenosis, and aneurysms of the aorta and its branch vessels. Sensitivity of over 73% and specificity of 78% diagnosing giant cell arteritis. So it works out very, very nicely. It's the preferred non-invasive imaging modality to monitor changes in aortic aneurysm morphology over time. Now, MRA can be used as well, but CTA tends to do better. Now, a number of different articles. Here's an article by Barty. Large vessel vasculitis is the most common form of primary vasculitis, uh, consisting of GCA, Takayashus, and idiopathic aortitis. Early diagnosis is critical to intervene and prevent complications, including stroke. Uh, it, this article also mentions the variable uh, imaging modalities that can be used and also how PET-CT is becoming uh, even more valuable looking at many of these diseases, looking at degree of activity and looking at response to therapy. Some examples, here's a nice case of giant cell arteritis. You can see the thickening of the anominid. You can see the thickening of the subclavian artery, which you really appreciate, particularly as you go to the coronal view. There's the left subclavian with the extensive thickening and narrowing of the vessel. And here it is again from a sagittal view. There's the thickening of the left subclavian and the narrowing of the vessel. Very nicely seen there. Here's another example of giant cell arteritis. You can see the soft tissue thickening of the abdominal aorta. You can track it downward, and it also involves the common iliac arteries. You can see it very nicely on the coronal perspective. And you can see when you do 3D volume rendering, the narrowing of the aorta down to the bifurcation by this infiltration, this giant cell arteritis. And here's just a few more images showing that very nicely as well. Now, the differentiation imaging between giant cell and Takayashu's can be difficult. Again, giant cell is older patients and it's females and more common in the Western countries. Skip lesions are also more common with giant cell. Now, the second large vasculitis, large vessel vasculitis, is Takayashu's. It's also known as aortic arch syndrome or pulseless disease, idiopathic inflammatory disease that predominantly affects the large vessels such as the aorta, its major branches, and coronary and pulmonary arteries. It's characterized by a panarteritis affecting all three layers. One of the things about Takayashu's compared to giant cell, it occurs worldwide, but more common in Asia. 
it's predominantly women by greater than seven to one ratio. And you can see when you look at the American College of Rheumatology criteria, age is less than 40. Remember, giant cell was over 50. So things you can see, claudication of the extremities, decreased brachial artery pressure, blood pressure differences of more than 10 uh, millimeters uh, in between the arms, brewy over the subclavian artery, as well as abnormal arterial uh, imaging. The arch is the most common area involved in Takayashu's and its branches. We most commonly think about the left subclavian artery as the key vessel of involvement. Uh, the pulmonary arteries and coronary arteries can also be involved. And Takayashu, so though we don't think of it that way, is one of the things that gives you coronary artery aneurysms. In late phase, you can see occlusive disease. And again, the mural thickening and occlusive disease, you can see progression of disease over time. Early on, you see concentric mural thickening. Later on, you see more of an occlusive process as you develop arterial stenosis, occlusion, or even dilatation in associated with mural thickening. So again, it's a progressive disease and it will progress over time. Here's a nice example showing you again the thickening of the right innominate and the left subclavian off the arch, very nicely shown. Here you can see, look at the caliber of the patient's carotid arteries. Look how narrow they are. There's almost minimal flow in the lumen of the vessels. You can see a little bit of thickening over the descending thoracic aorta as well. And again, here's a few more vessels looking at the left carotid and subclavian artery, really showing you this concentric thickening. And with that thickening, you see narrowing of the lumen. That becomes very classic in Takayashu's. Here's that same patient. Again, look at some of the aorta at the level of diaphragm, the thickening. And look at the branch vessels off the arch, which you can see very nicely here. And you can see the branch vessels off the arch are narrowed. So again, this inflammatory process around the vessel causes narrowing of the lumen and thickening of the vessel. Another example here in a patient with an incidental pericardial cyst, but also the changes of Takayashu's mark thickening of the left subclavian artery. Remember I mentioned before the key vessel is the left subclavian artery. And here you can see on the coronal as on the oblique, the oblique is a MIP image. Look at the irregularity of the left subclavian artery very nicely showing you the areas of narrowing and irregularity. Just a really good look at what you expect to get in uh, Takayashu's aortitis. Now we mentioned other vessels are involved. Here you see the thickening of the abdominal aorta with involvement also of both renal arteries with the lumen narrowed and the soft tissue thickening around the vessel increasing. And here you can see it as well, very nicely defined in the same patient. Now with Takayashu's, we'll mention that up to 15% of cases can involve the coronary arteries. Again, age is under 40, often under age 30. So under 40 or younger, females by an 8 to 1 article, 7 to 1 or 8 to 1 ratio, and patients are usually treated with corticosteroids. So if you can intervene early, you can change the course of disease. I mentioned about coronary artery aneurysms. Here's a patient with chest pain. You can see an aneurysm of the left main coronary artery, very nicely shown. There's no dissection in this patient. And you can see the thickening of the left main coronary artery due to the patient's primary disease process. Now, as we go from large to medial vessel disease, we then go from the giant cell, the Takayashu's, to medium vessel and come up with Kawasaki's. Kawasaki is a medium vessel disease associated with mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. It's typically in very young patients under age five, often under age two. The key thing about Kawasaki's is involvement of the coronary arteries. And because of that, you can get coronary artery aneurysms, which would can rupture leading to myocardial infarction or ischemia. There are many different findings and we'll show you some examples of that. Again, the key thing, of course, is the age. Sometimes we don't diagnose patients till they're in their teens and 20s of complications, but they were known because they were very sick as a child. Again, under age two commonly, but surely under age five. It's more common in males over females, more common in Asians, especially Japanese, and it's also known as mucutaneous lymph node syndrome. 
Again, just some of those numbers, very important. In terms of presentation, the fever for five or more days without a cause and four of the following five features, bilateral conjunctival injection, mucous membrane changes, the so-called strawberry tongue, extremity abnormalities, including erythema of the palms of the soles, edema of the hands or feet, a rash, and cervical lymphadenopathy. I mentioned coronary artery aneurysms, but there are many cardiac issues from pericardial effusion to mitral regurge to myocarditis to aortitis and aortic regurge, as well as congestive heart failure. Now, coronary artery aneurysms occur in up to 25% of patients treated with aspirin alone or no treatment. The aneurysms develop fairly quickly with the mortality rate approaching 2%. The aneurysms are typically more common in the proximal than distal coronary vessels, but they can be in any part of the vessel. Again, aneurysms may thrombose, which can lead to sudden death. Vascular complication rate is decreased with proper therapy. And again, the key is early diagnosis. You may remember there was a panic very early on in the COVID era where they thought there was a cluster of Kawasaki cases in New York, and they were thinking Kawasaki's was being uh, driven by COVID infection. Fortunately, that was not the case. Here's a nice example of an eight millimeter aneurysm, left main coronary artery in 11 year old, about 10 and a half years after the original diagnosis was made. Again, you can see the aneurysms, there's no calcification in the aneurysm, but you can see that aneurysm calcification can occur. The aneurysms can be large and they can be multiple. You can see that in this case very nicely multiple um, uh, coronary artery aneurysms in the right coronary artery. When we talk about coronary artery aneurysms, Kawasaki's always hits the top of my list. Obviously, there's atherosclerosis. Takayashi's is up there, and you can see many other causes as well. So at least in a young patient, it's something to consider. And you can see often when the patients present, they could be teenagers or even older, here you see a left anterior descending coronary artery aneurysm. That's a pretty good size. This patient had Kawasaki's disease several decades earlier. And here's a patient with multiple aneurysms. Look at the right coronary. There's an aneurysm and the largest aneurysm is proximally, but there's also an aneurysm in the distal aspect of the vessel, proximal and distal. And if I segment that vessel out, you can see the aneurysms, the more proximal one has calcification within it, and you can stretch the vessel out very nicely, showing you the multiple coronary artery aneurysms uh, in this patient with Kawasaki's disease. The other thing to mention in terms of uh, medium vessel disease is polyarthritis nodosa, but let's do this. I think I'm at 18 minutes already. Let's stop with polyarthritis nodosa, and we'll come back and pick it up in just a couple minutes. See you soon. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.